Uh, thanks everybody for coming. And um, we're on Google Chat, so thanks to people out there and uh, the people in the future that might look at this. Um, so I'm artist in residence at the SETI Institute, and um, I have uh, held this position for a couple years. And uh, it's been great. I've had uh, incredible access to scientists. It's uh, affected a lot of the work I've done and led to some new projects. Um, so tonight I'm going to uh, I have a, the great pleasure of introducing our next artists in residence. The program's growing. And uh, shortly after that, then we'll move into um, our speakers. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with those people. So um, I'll introduce the speakers in a bit. They are um, each going to do programs with Q&A that will be about an hour. We're going to have a little break in between. There is too much cheese and beer and wine out there, so please help us with that. Exits are round. They're green. Restrooms are in the back. Um, so uh, the purpose or the idea behind the Artist in Residence program in a nutshell, besides promoting the, uh, the goals of the SETI Institute itself, was to put artists in touch with scientists. There's at least uh, 70 scientists here at any one time, affiliated scientists. And so the idea was to encourage a cross-pollinization of ideas, uh, not with any specific goal in mind, just to see what would happen. So a lot of conversations have begun. And um, I mean, it's really a very sort of altruistic pursuit to encourage this type of thing. So um, our next uh, artist in residence are here. And um, we have a team of artist engineers deal largely in robotics, but everything related to that are from UC Santa Barbara. Danny Bazo is here, Carl Yorkies is here, and Marco Pellan is not here. He couldn't make it up tonight. So these guys are collaborating with John Jenkins, who's a senior scientist at the SETI Institute, a co investigator on Kepler, well known person in the field. And um, they're not going to get up and speak tonight. What, what we're going to do is be posting things online. As the project develops, they'll be speaking here at some point, no doubt, in the future. But it's very exciting to have this collaboration beginning. There are a couple other um, collaborative teams that are sort of uh, the process of bringing them on is in the background, but we're going to announce quite soon. Uh, some of those involve uh, bio artists. A couple of the teams are women. And so there's a, there's a, a lot going on with that. So it, it's really an exciting thing. So I'll just say, if you don't mind, help me. And I'm just going to welcome these folks here to the team. And I, and I like just say that the, the program started from a conversation I had with Jill Tarter. Karen Randall came in on that, and she was instrumental in, in taking it further. Edna DeVore, who's here tonight, um, was very much behind it. We have Adrian Brown and Lily that are helping on the, in the background, or maybe that's the foreground. And uh, Frank Marchese has been big on that as well. So it's a team thing, and, and the program's really seen a lot of support from the, uh, the scientists. And it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. So I'm going to move into our speakers. Um, it's a personal thrill to have Robert Henke here tonight. Um, I admire a lot of what this man does. And so thanks, guys. Um, so Robert's sort of tagline is, is he says he, he builds machines that create art. And, and um, well, I think he does a lot more than that. Very, a renowned musician. Um, installation artist, really an incredible guy. And um, I reached out to him because I knew of his work and thought it would be interesting here and said, if you're ever in the States, you know, would you think of speaking? He said, as a matter of fact, he's teaching at Stanford right now as a guest speaker. So it was convenient for him to come in. I'm not going to say anything more. He'll say plenty. Um, he is performing Saturday in San Francisco, if any of you are interested. So Robert's coming on. After a short Q&A, we'll do a little break, like I said, and then we'll carry on to uh, Tagi Amidani, who's, you know, that's a whole nother introduction. I'll get to Tagi when we get there. Thanks very much. One, two, Hello. Um, after this fantastic introduction, there's almost not much more biographical I can add to it. Um, maybe as far as the talk is concerned, I have this habit of riding my bike everywhere. So I rode my bike from the Stanford campus to CT. And oops, whilst doing so, I decided I need to change my talk a little bit. So that happens if I ride my bike. 
And um, I talk 40% um, about things which are very much related, hopefully, to um, or tailored to a specific environment of SETI. Um, and this is artistic research, whatever it is, is going to be. Um, but before getting into this, maybe we can lower the gain of the microphone a tiny little bit. One, two, test, test, one, two, one, two. Yeah, better. Um, still almost feedbacking. One, two, yeah, that seems to be better. Thank you. Um, I like to talk a little bit about how I came to what I'm doing because I think it's very essential to understand what I'm doing within the perspective of um, why I'm doing it. And the thing is, I'm very much obsessed by talking about artistic expression versus engineering. And I have some contradictions here. It's still almost feedbacking. Maybe we can lower the volume of the, of the speakers a little bit. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that sounds better. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> something is clear if you watch this picture. You probably most of you know it. It's a, a Monet painting. And it's very clear that's art. Um, it's in a museum, it has no purpose apart from looking beautiful and being amazing. But what the hell is this in this context? Um, this is not art, right? This is a computer. Um, I took the photo at the Computer History, Mu History Museum, not so far away from where we are now. Fantastic place to be. Um, and it's a PDP-8. But if you look at this machine, you see a lot of artistic decisions have been made. Um, there's a beautiful symmetry here. Um, there's a choice of colors, there's a choice of arrangement, there's a choice of fonts. There's a lot of choices uh, someone made um, to make this thing look cool. And um, we have no idea who this person is. Um, this thing is not in a museum. Well, actually, right now it is. Um, <laughs> but it was not intended to be there. This is clearly a piece of engineering. But if I look at this, and this is something which happened to me from very early days onwards, um, it touches me. I'm deeply touched by the beauty of machines. And um, this brings me to my history. I don't come from an artistic background at all. Um, my parents were engineers, my grandparents were engineers, and probably my grand-grand-grandparents were engineers too. Um, the idea that someone in our family is doing art was not part of the program. Um, so I don't have a formal musical education. I don't, I've never seen an art school from the inside um, when I was young. Um, I just had uh, good luck to go to a high school with a few good teachers. And um, so um, I was always interested in art, and I kind of knew it. I went to museums, and I looked at abstract paintings, and I found them beautiful. Um, but yeah, this was not the, the career path. Uh, there was a pivotal moment. This was when I discovered electronic music, because suddenly I realized, oh, there is art which involves computers and circuits and stuff like that. And from this moment onwards, it became clear, OK, what I'm going to do is something which has to do with sound um, and electronics. Um, sound engineering, right? It's perfect escape from the engineering path. So I became a sound engineer. And I made music, um, of course. But I never considered myself um, a real artist um, until very recently, as a matter of fact. And everything else just happened and emerged because I was at the right time, at the right moment, met the right people made records, played concerts, and so <clears throat> suddenly I became an artist. But the engineering part of my art was always very <coughs> prominent and very um, important. And um, we need to talk about this engineering versus art um, in detail. But I thought I'd show you two of my more recent projects, um, because this gives you a bit an idea how I think. Um, oh, this is photos I forgot about. Um, I built own hardware. This is a box which I built uh, in many, many long hours of labor um, to facilitate performing electronic music on stage. Electronic music is something which is very abstract. You use computers for this. Um, you write code. Um, you operate it with a mouse. And you have to make decisions um, how to actually perform these things, because there's no known instrument. You define your own instruments. So this is an instrument I built, and it was a lot of work. And um, this is another instrument I helped building. This is a very early screenshot of Ableton Live, the software I was partly responsible for developing, and which pretty much everyone is uses these days. 
And um, this is a piece of engineering, obviously. And the reason why I show you this photo is because I felt a little bit a contradiction. And this contradiction only left myself um, within the last maybe five years. And this contradiction was when I spent too much time engineering, which I really like. I like writing software. I like building hardware. I like thinking about technical problems. It's a joy to come to a solution. Um, I felt, ah, I'm making all these tools. I should make music instead. But I liked making tools. Then I made music, and I felt, ah, I could make better music if I develop a different tool. So I went back to tool making. And um, so I was a split personality, a bit schizophrenic. Um, I make tools. I make music. And um, <clears throat> somehow this really bothered me. And a few years ago, I came to the realization that maybe all it needs for me to find my inner freedom is to define tool making as art. And um, since I did this, since I simply changed my perception of my own world, um, I'm a much happier person. And as a matter of fact, I changed the way I create art because I'm informed by <laughs> making tools as an art. And um, so let's talk about my art. Oh, more slides. This is, happens if I change my slides before I talk. Um, this is a tool I made for an installation. Um, it's written in a programming language called MaxMSP. That's a graphical language. You program by making connections between modules. And within those boxes, there's more modules and more modules within. Um, it's beautiful and it's nice to do this, but no one sees it. It's a piece of code inside a box. This is the box. It's an installation piece. Um, people are in the circle of loudspeakers, and they're operating this little surface here, which is a matrix of 16 to 16 buttons and LEDs. And people can play with this matrix and create some interesting, well, more or less interesting sonic results. Um, the point is, this is the outside. This is what everyone sees. This is the inside, which no one sees. But for me, it's as important and as an um, essential part of my art that this inside is made by Why? Why? Why am I running a low battery power? You're going to have to talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk much faster. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this is part of it, but no one knows it. And nowadays, I would try to make this part a little bit more visible. Anyway, so I figured out that the core of what I'm doing is something which I can boil down to these sentences. I build machines, and then I step back and watch and listen to what unfolds. And within this sentence, there's one very important statement. And this is the statement that I actually go back, I step back from the process of doing things into a process of observing. I observe my own machines. And this is what the machines can do for me. The machines can do things which allow me to step back. When I play the piano, um, I can't step back because I have to keep this box running. If I build a machine which does things, I can step back. And I can uh, reach a position where I become the observer of my own work. And this is something extremely powerful, because it allows me to um, treat a time-based art like music with the same concept as I would treat a painting. A painter can do the same thing. That's why I put the Monet picture at the beginning. The painter can step back and can watch the image um, he created um, in different lights and everything. And I can do the same thing with my computer-generated art, because the computer executes something in real time, and I can step back and take the role of an observer. And this is very powerful. Um, so I figured out that my work is concerned with sound, first of all. When I think about music, when I think about what really, really grabs my attention, it's not the melodies. It's not at the first place, harmonics. It's not in the first place um, lyrics, not at all, actually, in most cases. Um, but it's a timbre. I'm addicted to sound. For me, the world is an amazing place occupied with fantastic sounds. And um, I run to the streets, and I listen to sounds, and I think, this is cool. This is interesting. Um, there's pretty much not a single sound on this planet I don't like. Um, and if I combine sound with structure, I end up with music because music is, in my opinion, structured sound. 
Everything else is conventions. Um, and <clears throat> as it happens, I'm also interested in visual arts. This is something which was even more buried um, below engineering than my music making. Um, but it was always there. I was drawing little things. I have books of my paintings at home. They were not really good, but certainly there's an interest. At some point, I noticed I can apply the same ideas of building machines that I apply to um, auditive things to visual things, too. And this is something which led to a project I will introduce a bit later. Um, but basically, in the visual side, in the visual world, sound and structures can be replaced by shapes. And so we have sound structures and shapes. This is a photo of a water reservoir. It's a very unpleasant place, actually. It's in um, the center of Berlin, below ground. It's um, a huge place, which was used as a gigantic water tank for only, um, I think, five years in the late 19th century. And afterwards, Berlin decided that they changed the water supply in a completely different way. So it was, for more than 100 years, not in use. This space is really huge. Um, if you imagine me, I would be this size. Um, so for those uh, online, I would, my head would be below the, maybe you see my mouse point, I don't know. Well, I'm small. Um, and this place is cold, this place is wet, and this place is very dark. You can't do anything useful with this place apart from sound art. And uh, a very nice curator discovered this place and decided, well, since sound art is the only thing which makes sense there, let's do it. So this curator invites people to do things there since the last 15 years or so. And so I went there in a really hot summer day um, with winter clothing because it's cold. And um, I tried to try out a few things. And there's a longer story behind this, um, which has to do with funding and with the difficulties to get the project done, which is a complete different talk, which could last for hours and hours. Um, <laughs> My original concept was having a lot of small loudspeakers in this place and playing back um, spoken words uh, carefully tuned in such a way that the spoken words merge into a really nice music uh, um, choir-like uh, structure from um, further apart. Um, it didn't work out due to the known financial con uh, constraints, but the curator told me, well, do something else in there. And so I came up with something else. Um, to give you a bit of more idea about this space, because space is important for me, um, you see this is a, a structure of concentric rings. And the entrance is on the right bottom side. And you go in there and you experience very, very diff different echoes and reverbs um, and interesting sonic phenomena depending on where you are located. And <coughs> So you, you shout in one ring, and the echo comes back later. And um, you localize a person somewhere completely different than where the person actually is, because there's reflections on the walls. It's a really, really fascinating place. It has a very long reverb, but not the type of reverb you're used in a cathedral, but something very different. For those who are a bit more into um, the terminology, it's a series of connected delay lines. Um, if you want to put it more poetic, it's a series of connected memories of time. Um, first idea, moving, having a lot of simple speakers um, all over the place. Too expensive, didn't work out, forget about it. The final solution for my project in there looks like, <coughs> this, like this. I only use six loudspeakers and one very low, um, big um, speaker for low frequencies. And what I did in this water reservoir um, was I came up with the idea to treat this whole space as the inside of a church organ. Um, probably, um, it's very unlikely that most of you have this experience of being inside a church organ while it's being played. Um, a huge church organ is huge. Um, in a really big cathedral or something like this, you can imagine the inside of a church organ having approximately the height of half of this room. Like, imagine the room from here to here just turned 90 degrees. This is the inside of a church organ, or larger, and you have stairs in there, and you have um, organ pipes all over the place. And if you're inside the organ while it's playing, you're experiencing sound from different locations, and different parts of the sounds from different locations. 
and you're also very close to low frequency pipes. And you don't hear only the low frequency pitch, you're not hearing the fundamental frequency, but you're really feeling and hearing the air. It's like um, For those who are going into clubs and listening to bass heavy music, the, su the sound you hear if you're very close to a subwoofer and you hear the, the air um, turbulences, this is what you experience, experience inside a church organ. So what I did was I built a church organ. And I built a church organ by um, using something which uh, I wrote for a completely different purpose, a so-called physical model. Uh, in audio synthesis, a physical model is basically a description of a behavior. In this um, regards, the description of a behavior of a pipe. And if I adjust the parameters correctly, the pipe uh, can have the right dimensions and the right properties to sound, for instance, like an organ pipe. Um, this model is a bad model, technically. Bad model means the pitch is inaccurate, um, the behavior is uh, sometimes uh, unexpected because it's a very bad numerical ex um, um, approximation of the real thing. So what happens is I play back different pitches um, of this instrument inside the structure and the different pitches interact with the resonances of the room and the different pitches are slightly unpredictable because of the flaws of the model and <clears throat> The way I create these pitches in the first place is by um, cascading a set of um, objects which I build, which basically modulate the pitch. So you don't need to understand what this does, um, apart from the fact that at the left side, what is coming in is a rhythmical um, structure. And what comes out on the left, on the right side, is a constantly changing melody. Um, defined by some mathematical parameters, which um, I have, I did set, so I understand what's going on in theory, but where the complexity of the result is, by the pure nature of the process, so high that I can't predict it. And so I can predict the general behavior, but I don't know what's going on every single second. And I have um, six of those, no, actually 12 of those things running in an asynchronous way at the same time. So as a result, my little church organ here plays random pitches. Not really random, because they're all carefully chosen. Um, but I don't know what's coming next. And I can step back and listen to this. And I fine-tune the probabilities or the changes within the structure until it sounds right to me. Um, on this image here, you see a little bit the distribution of the sounds. Um, basically, what this image tells you is that the sound travels in very different ways depending on the pitches. And this makes this whole organ experience an experience which dramatically changes depending on your listening position. That's the whole idea of the installation, that people experience the space. They walk through the space, and depending on their position, they think the sound must come from here or from here. Or they experience very interesting changes in timbre um, or in pitch um, just because they walk. And combining this with constantly changing pitch of the organ itself creates a lot of variety. Um, so it's a very interesting experience. Unfortunately, I don't have a good recording with me because I didn't think about talking about the specific installation. Um, but it gives you a bit an idea how I think about spaces and machines and sound. Um, this one I need to skip unfortunately, because I don't have so much time. Um, I could talk about my art for hours. Um, I guess you know already. Um, a part of what I skip here is, um, <clears throat> this is a machine which uh, our uni university department has. It's a so-called wave field synthesis array. Um, I don't go into detail, but there's something which I find <coughs> remarkable here. In order to operate this, I uh, developed a few interfaces. These interfaces show movements of sound sources. Their, own perp their, their whole purpose of those interfaces is to give me visual feedback. They are not meant to be beautiful or something like this. They're just there for technical reasons. However, um, and what you see here is mathematics. The, the big uh, thing is a kind of um, low-pass filtered um, random function, which moves the sources around. Um, there's circular movements, and there's quantized uh, random functions. And they create those beautiful images. This is nothing I did on purpose. Um, I really wasn't interested in making great pictures. I was interested in the sound. 
but the process um, has this nice property. This is another um, image of um, a screenshot of the more refined interface I developed for this machine. And again, um, it's just a user interface. It's just something which gives me visual feedback. Um, but it has its very own quality, or this one, or this one. And um, of course, the next thing I'd like to do is exploring the visual quality of this for visual purposes. Because the structure is in place, and it doesn't matter if it's creating sound or movement in space or traces of light. And traces of light brings me to the one work which um, I spend probably most of the time for a single work ever, and this is a laser-based installation. And this deserves also a full one or two hour talk. Um, but to come to the very last point, which I really like to talk, I need to shorten this too. Um, first of all, lasers is something which I was always fascinated. It's engineering in the first place, and it creates light and beauty. This is a helium neon laser tube from the 1980s. This is something I had at home because um, my father brought me one. Um, the power of this is uh, uh, probably a tenth or a twentieth of the cheapest laser point that you can buy. Um, and it needs high voltage to operate. And, um, but this was the laser I had. And I was really fascinated because lasers have a very specific light. Um, other people share the fascination for lasers, but what they do is not the things I would do. If you talk to someone about lasers uh, for visual display, this is the images you get. And um, this is as cliche as it can be. And people draw deers, you know, in red and green. And I was very certain that you can do something else with lasers, which is um, <coughs> less cheesy. And um, nothing against deers. Um, so how does it work in general? Um, I come from engineering, so I need to understand what's going on before I work with stuff. Um, to create a white laser beam, you have, or a colorful laser beam, you have to combine um, different colors. So you have a green laser, you have a red laser, and you have a blue laser, and you have to see me transparent prisms. And if it's all adjusted carefully, the result is white light. And white light is one single light beam. In order to draw something with this beam, you have to move the beam. And you do this with um, scanners or galvanometers. Um, these are tiny little mirrors controlled by electromagnets. Very expensive things. And um, Oops, wrong slide. And <clears throat> with this structure, you can actually draw with lasers. An industrial grade laser looks like this. This is from a company called Coherent. It's probably the only company on this planet who has in their portfolio um, defense, research, medicine, art. Um, interesting combination. Um, and they make fantastic laser sources like this one. And this is the mirrors you need to actually make a laser move. This thing is the size of my, my palm of my hand, something like that, and also hilariously expensive. You see these two mirrors here, and it, the electromagnets which move them. Um, you, have drive, you need to have driver circuits. You have to have a lot of other stuff around. For instance, temperature control, because lasers are very sensitive to operating temperature. All these things make a, a very good laser system really, really expensive. And part of the story is how I managed to be able to actually work with such a system. But this is another story for another time. Um, I'm basically, I met a manufacturer. And I had the good luck that the manufacturer was located 10 minutes bike ride from where I live. Um, after doing almost two years of research, um, I figured out that the things I need are next to my door. Um, this is sometimes how it is. What you see here is a very first test. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to achieve here was I wanted to draw circles with a random distribution. And um, what I failed to do here is blanking out um, the beams where no circles were drawn. Um, so you have to imagine that in order to draw such a structure, I have one single beam of light. So I need to draw a circle, move somewhere else, draw a circle, move somewhere else, draw a circle. And at the end of the thing, I need to repeat this whole thing. And I need to do this very fast. And um, that's quite a challenge. So usually, if you work with lasers, you either draw very simple things, or you draw complex things, and they are really slow and flickery. Um, the great challenge for me was to draw something which is complex, 
because I like complexity, and at the same time looks like it's very elegant and simple. Um, I did a bit more research, and I came up with such figures. These figures are interesting from an um, electronic musician's perspective, because what I do is I operate those lasers with audio signals. Um, not audio signals which are intended to be listened to, um, but the technical signal is an audio signal, and therefore I can apply um, typically processes I would apply to audio to my visual side too. This is a two-dimensional low-pass filtering um, or averaging of the signal. And the low-pass filter has a resonant property. And this resonant property means if I move the laser from here to here and then down to here, um, I create an overshoot. The laser moves and the filter shoots over and moves back, moves forth, moves back. So I got this little bit a pendulum motion. And if I have the pendulum motion in two dimensions, I got this nice circus. So I can apply knowledge from my music technology, knowledge, and from my composition um, experience towards a different medium. Um, and this is a great experience. Um, since I can't access the laser all the time because it's expensive, I needed to find ways to do it at home. I bought an oscilloscope. And as you can see, oscilloscopes and lasers go well together. The only problem is the oscilloscope is much faster. So I'm tempted to do very complex structures and then try with the lasers and it doesn't look good. Um, <clears throat> as part of my research here, um, I came up with better and better ways to draw nice things. And um, at some point I managed to convince a gallery to show them my work. And <clears throat> this is a photo from the very first um, day where I was at this gallery in France and gave a presentation of what I could do. Because for the gallery, it was a little bit the same as maybe for most of you here. Um, lasers, images, no idea what this is going to look like. And a photo doesn't really tell. Um, <clears throat> so I decided, OK, I need to go there. I need to demonstrate um, what I do. And um, I think I was successful because afterwards um, they said, yes, we're going to do this. And um, up to this point, I basically did this installation or the preparation for this installation really out of the blue. Um, because originally it was planned to do a very small laser thing for a small gallery in uh, Manhattan. And it turned out that due to laser safety regulations of the state of New York, it's pretty much impossible. But at the same time, I was so much hooked at the topic that I didn't want to let go. So I developed something without knowing where to show it. Um, and I developed it until a point where I felt I kept something to show, which is these things and these things. And um, after I got the green light from the gallery, I started to seriously working with it. And <clears throat> I rented a dance studio space and set up the lasers. These are the black boxes here on the ceiling. And started to seriously thinking about what to do in the specific space. And at the very end <clears throat> of my two-week um, rehearsal time there, I invited a few curators and friends for a public test. And this is extremely important because I work by myself. Um, so the only resonance I have is the resonance with my own thoughts. I can think, well, maybe I like what I'm doing, or I like to move things in a different direction, or here are the problems. Um, but there's no external feedback. And the external feedback is extremely essential. So I invite those people. And those people stayed very long. They're very happy. And um, no, the guy in the front is not sleeping. He is looking at the lasers. Um, <laughs> they are bright. Um, so um, after the successful test, I made a preview movie. And I'd like to show it to you. Filming the lasers is a very difficult thing because it's not like a video beamer, a uh, video projector. It's just this one single ray of light moving around. Um, you have to adjust carefully the shutter of the camera and all these things to capture an image of a laser show which tells you the real story. If you expose it too long, you see things which you've never seen in the real world. If the exposure time is too short, um, you don't see it at all. So it was quite a challenge. Um, the space in France, maybe I need to move. Oh, what, what did I do? I need to move a little bit. This is a, a space uh, in, in France. And the reason why I show it to you now is because it helps you understanding the video. It's a huge space. There's one wall which is um, 
36 meters long. That's something like multiplied with, I think, three, four um, foot. So it's really long. It's twice as long as this room. And um, so I needed four lasers in one row. And it was quite a challenge to make a preview movie. And there's all these columns in this room. Um, you see here, there's these columns. And <clears throat> to give you an idea how this thing looks, I show the preview movie now. Um, or a part of it, at least. So you see it's a very long, thin um, object of light constantly changing. Um, actually, I can let it run without the sound. Maybe this works, yeah. Uh, what, what you see here is four lasers drawing this shape. And the shape itself uh, is, there's a lot of random involved here, but obviously the random is controlled in a very strict way to um, make sense overall. And this is my general way of working. I create processes which control random, which keep random in boundaries. And then I work as a conductor of my own work and say, um, more movement here. Um, let's make it all bigger. Let's move faster. Let's have a movement to the left side. But I leave it up to the individual uh, algorithms to do the exact movement. So I cannot predict what's going on here in every detail. But I can, just like a conductor, say, brightness. And it's getting brighter. And um, this is very amazing. And <clears throat> Since this is four independent processes, I did a technical experiment. And this technical experiment uh, had to do with the fact that I thought, OK, I have those four laser beams where I cannot predict where they are in every given moment. <coughs> but I like to use the data of those laser beams um, as a data which I use to feed another process, for instance, changing the brightness. And my very first um, approach to, towards this was, OK, let's just define uh, an area where the laser should turn off as, an, as a thought experiment, uh, as a technical exercise. So I defined this zone of a, a blanking zone, where I say, in this zone, never laser. And then in order to figure out if my program really works, I decided to move this zone um, just as an experiment. In order to make this working, I made the movement constant so that I can work on the program while, it's, while the movement happens. So I built this black shadow. It was never intended that this is something which stays there. It was a technical experiment. The interesting thing which happened um, is after looking at this for half an hour and fine tuning it, I turned it off because I felt, OK, I know it works great. I can start doing the real thing. And I turned it off, and suddenly the image became flat. And I thought, wow, this shadow adds something. This shadow is important. And so I made the shadow uh, a part of the installation. And I added uh, a noise to the shadow to give this void, this nothing, this negation of the light, a meaning. And I made sure that this shadow also shadows the sound, which, of course, technically doesn't because it's not existing. So what happens in the gallery space is <coughs> you see these columns, and you see the people from the opening, and um, Yeah, let's, let's stay here. Um, and the shadow is moving around. And the sound is uh, constructed in such a way that um, if the shadow moves, the sound of the shadow moves along with the shadow. And there are sounds which um, seem to originate from the lasers itself, but it's a fake. It's a kind of a Hollywood movie trick to um, make this more convincing. Um, this sound also is shadowed by the shadow. Um, by simply uh, muting the sound in a very elegant way when the shadow passes. So as a matter of fact, 
this non-existing shadow really is a believable black object. And um, I like to play with this. I like to play with a perception of something is there, and it's only there as a neg negotiation of light. Um, very powerful. Um, one of the things which amazes me with lasers is, unlike the video projection, black means black. Because you have this single ray of light. Um, if you point somewhere, there's light. If you point somewhere else, then light somewhere else. But there's no bleeding of light anywhere else. And this means um, I also have no boundaries. <clears throat> if, if I turn the laser off, you don't know anymore where the laser was. Um, no one knows how far I can go with the lasers. And as you see in these pictures, for instance, on the right side, the lasers go all the way up the ceiling or all the way down. Um, so I can extend my territories and I can um, narrow my territories down. And I can define the, the boundaries of these territories in a very floating way. And this is extremely beautiful because it's so immaterial. It's so not defined by a frame. This is one of the reasons why I like to work with this medium. Because in a way, it's like sound. <clears throat> it has no boundaries. It travels. And I can travel with light here, too. Um, I'd like to show you a second movie, um, which I took after the um, um, installation at the last day, I think. And this gives you a bit more an idea of how overwhelming this whole thing in reality is. I hope the connection is fast enough to show this. Hmm. That's not the image I was expecting. Let's reload the page. All right. Yeah, this gives you a good idea of the size um, with the person in front of it. Come on. I skip a few moments here. I forgot to look at the clock when we started. How much time do I still have? It's, it's 10 days, so it's when you're ready for Q&A, but do, do your thing. OK, well, I've, I, have <coughs> I have a few very little things which I will talk about now without um, showing you any more slides. Let's have just a nice picture here and um, rush through in 10 seconds. Um, yeah, that's a good picture. Um, I wanted to talk about artistic research, and I do it very quick, um, because you know artistic research is a term I come across very often recently in, in press texts of artists, and I was always skeptical, because I felt research is something else than what um, these artists these artists do. Um, however, on my bike right here, I thought about it again, and I had half an hour, so because I made a detour, um, <clears throat> and the point is, what I do is I observe the world outside. For instance, I um, selectively listen to sounds, and then I record sounds. And the sounds com can be considered as data, because at the end, I have actually data. I have 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit, whatever, file. And what I do next is I um, analyze the data. But my way of analyzing is um, maybe a analyzing um, which follows rules which I don't know yet. But what I'm basically doing is I apply tools 
um, which help me looking at specific properties of those files. I apply filters to look at specific parts of the sound. And I'm scanning the sound I have. I'm scanning my data to figure out, is there something which is interesting? Is there something which triggers a resonance? And <clears throat> in a way, that's uh, a bit like looking at a pattern in random data coming from outer space. Um, I just look at the pattern which resonates with my own patterns, and the data comes uh, from a washing machine in a um, youth hostel. Um, but I apply the same rules. I'm looking for something. And if I find something, then um, this leads me to my next steps. And um, the only question is, in, as far as scientific research is concerned, what constitutes interesting? And interesting is uh, something which is totally subjective within myself, but is at the same time informed by what other artists did in the past. And this brings me in a very quick um, circle to the end of what I'd like to talk about. Um, so I create something based on my own research. I do experiments, I try things out, I come to conclusions, I learn from those things, I build complex, more complex systems, I do more research technically as well as um, artistically, I come to conclusions. And at some point I create a work of art. And now the interesting thing is how does the work of art fits in within the scientific discourse? The work of art is, as a matter of fact, the research result. And what comes now is peer review. And that's interesting, because actually peer review is exactly the same thing as showing the artwork to the world, because the world reacts to the artwork. The world says, that's great. Or the world says, well, <laughs> OK, so what? And the so what notion is this paper is not worth the, the paper it's printed on. And the that's great notion is, yes, this is a significant finding. And if the artwork is a significant finding, um, it serves as the basis for future artworks by other people or by my own people, which is exactly how scientific research works. And I found this very interesting in this context, that um, despite the different um, res um, results and the different met methodologies in some ways, yes, indeed, there are similarities. And um, I leave it with this and say thank you. Thank you. Well, I could listen for hours. Um, so a couple of questions, and sort of interesting, Robert, finished on that idea of uh, sort of creating a footsteps that others then follow in or that, that one work leads to another. Uh, one of the things before I, I met him and reached out that I was very impressed by is his generosity. And on his website, which I encourage you to go to, roberthenke.com, um, there's some great writings which were very helpful because I'm doing a lot with sound myself. But also he built an instrument called the granulator, which is a complex software instrument, amazing instrument. And he just gave that away. And I, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a real spirit of generosity in what he does. So we're going to have just a couple questions. I hope they're really good ones. And then we're going to break. Do you have somebody you want to talk to? Okay. I hope it's really good. Um, quick silly question and then a serious question. The silly question is we all know that cats like chasing laser pointers. Did you expose a cat to this installation? I, I didn't, no. Okay, uh, the serious question, the music that's in the installation or at least accompanying the film, did you compose that and does it relate to the algorithm that you're using for the visuals? Uh, yes, uh, could be a long answer. The short answer is um, I wasn't really focusing on the musical side very much because I was completely obs uh, obsessed with the visual side. Um, and until the very last stage, I didn't have a, a precise idea what I'd like to do musically. But I clearly felt I need a musical uh, counterpart. And so I decided to do basically two things. The, the swoosh, which I um, wanted to be physical, so I added a sound to this. And the high-pitched sound, which um, has a nice um, coincidence with the laser itself. It makes a laser physical object just by the sonic side. And there's those um, transformed piano notes which serve as a background. And they are connected to parts of the algorithms of the visual side. Um, but their main purpose is to create a, <coughs> a certain background color, an emotional backdrop, um, which makes it easier to go in there and immerse yourself. So in, in a way, it's a very classical film music approach. Um, 
the music serves as a background for the visual side. Um, I plan to work on a, a future installation, actually you now on a concert piece with lasers, where the ratio between sound and uh, visual side is really 50-50. But that's not the focus of this work. So one more question. Oh. I like that you used uh, white light. Um, it's distinguishing and it gives a black and white effect. Have you ever uh, thought about uh, projecting the, the laser behind um, a screen? And um, I, I guess that's my question. Um, absolutely. In the very first uh, conceptual drawing I made, uh, I had the idea of having a screen in the middle of the room and the laser on one side and the audience on the other side. Because there is an inherent problem with this. These beasts are dangerous. Um, if we talk about um, 10 uh, or more watts of pure light, not the electrical power you put in, but the light you put out. And if you don't move this beam fast enough and it just points straight to you, you put your hand in it, it hurts. Um, so you don't want to put your eye in it, definitely not. And um, you can lit up uh, pieces of paper with it. And therefore, um, this installation has a bit an issue that I can only allow people to go to the first column and not any further. So there's what you, what you don't see here is this is thin wire, so this is kind of blocked. And to overcome this uh, barrier, I thought it would be nice to project from the back onto a semi-transparent surface so that people can go really close. Um, it just didn't happen there because the geometry of the room didn't support it. Um, but in general, I like this idea a lot, um, to have the projection from the back. Yeah. It, it's also like possible. Flash of color. Oh, yeah, N numerous times. Um, it's so tempting because this white light is composed, in this case, out of blue and yellow, and not RGB, but blue and yellow. And I adjusted the color temperature so often I can't think about it. And every time I only turned on uh, the blue or the yellow laser, I thought, ah, it needs to change because it's so overwhelming, because it's this pure color. Um, but at the same time, it's an effect. You know, it's like the, the big chime in the orchestra, or the big gong. Um, you need a reason for it. And afterwards, you need to do something with it. So yeah, everything is white, and suddenly, batang, it's blue. And then, what do you do with this? You know, you, you, how do you get back to white? Um, I gave up on this. I think I, I do a project in the future where I deliberately play with color. And then this is the focus. But here, I just decided, OK, the color uh, creates a lot of problems, and I have no solutions for them. So it's stayed white. Cool. Thank you, Robert Hanke. Um, <laughs> and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. And to show our, uh, our appreciation at intermission, we have beverages and cheese and all kinds of things galore. So let's call it like uh, 13 and a half minutes. Um, we're going to follow <laughs> with um, Tagi Amirani, who's an Iranian filmmaker, senior TED fellow. And he does um, mostly political films, but this is an early film, and it deals with space and things that are close to the SETI Institute. So we'll take a break, um, a little bit casual, and then we'll yell and say, let's go. So um, <laughs> facilities are back there. Drinks and so on are, are there. And thanks for being here. That's good. Good to see you. I'm sorry, I came in the
You're going to wow with that? You're going to wow them? I don't think so. This is from my earlier work. It is. Yeah, he's great. You know, it changes what he does in this context. He, um, he took it more technical because the crowd tends to. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it. Well, it's all happening here. Right, I'm so glad you made it. Yeah, me too, man. Thanks for the tweet. What trick is that? That's for the tweet. Oh, the tweet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm living in Berkeley, so I'm a good oh, scholar in Berkeley. I just saw you yesterday. I saw you for 10 weeks. Yeah. I think it lasts on here. Well, actually. Yeah, yeah, but this this your this morning. So I started last week, so it's like a three year five. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cool thing is we can do one more so in my teeth. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to be I'm just asking. Yeah. Look at you, man. I haven't seen you dress like a normal person before. I know this is normal. Is this normal? This is normal. I can't do that. No, you're not. That's what they want you to think. Awesome. So what's better, man? What's the difference? What's the difference? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to well, let's just stick with the conversation. Yeah, you, you, have, you have something about it. I think that's what I have Friday afternoon. Is it better for you? I see something. Oh, it's a cast restaurant. Yeah, where are you? You're the city. I saw it. I see you on the Facebook. You're all over the place. I see you. I see you. But it's something else. You're not always all over the place. The more I thought about it, the more I thought about it. Yeah, different cheese. Yeah. I'm not okay around here, but even if you mess, yeah. whatever, yes, it's much better. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Help me. Should I grab that thing? Yeah. Should I just unplug this? Yeah, you just unplug it. So you want to see if I put the Google in like nice and case, you know. So that, would, that would help you, right? So they hang out. Let me get a feature from here. Okay. What happened? So you go to Google Plus. No, leave it. Sorry about that. Well, okay for here. Okay, well, let's do our best. So, just want to make sure the screen settings work like last time. Let's we'll see what happens. So, I need to get this up there. So full screen and that central.
Good to go. Um, okay, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Recap, that was Robert Hanke, and for the people that came late, we um, welcomed our next artists in residence. That's um, a growing group of people. There's not a single artist in residence anymore, so I'm no longer alone. Um, Danny Bazo, Carl Yerkes, they're both here if you want to talk to them later, and John Jenkins, who um, they're collaborating with, uh, co-investigator co uh, on the Kepler mission. Okay, so um, Tagi Amirani is um, a filmmaker. He's Iranian, a senior TED fellow, great guy. And I only know that not only because what friends told us, but we, he was uh, asked to speak here, and we had some emails. And then Sunday night I was at a, on a roof party in midtown Manhattan after the World Science Festival. And somebody grabbed me by the shoulder and said, hey, he's over there. So we actually met in New York for the first time a couple days ago, which was wonderful sort of small worlds meeting. Um, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot. He's going to tell you about what he's working on. But his films are, are largely political at this point. This is one of his earliest films, and it has to do with space, and therefore it has to do with interest at the SETI Institute. So I'm going to bring Tagi up here. Now we're going to, he's going to speak um, a little bit, films 50 minutes, and then I guess we continue back to the cheese and drinks. But here you go. Thanks, Tagi. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I used to introduce myself uh, as an Iranian physicist turned filmmaker, uh, but ever since uh, outside agents started assassinating our nuclear scientists, <laughs> I am just a filmmaker. <laughs> and uh, as a filmmaker, you make films so you don't have to speak, so you don't have to do this, but I am going to make an exception because you're an amazing crowd. I feel seriously intimidated in the company of so super cool scientists and Silicon Valley smart people. Just by looking at me, I'm intimidated just being here. So um, let's just, I'm going to talk a little bit about the film you're about to see. Uh, just connect a few dots along the journey which led to the making of this first film. And, um, and also I'm here at the church of SETI confessing that I've stolen from Carl Sagan. I've stolen a lot from Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking. I've stolen, I've stolen from filmmakers and scientists, so that's my confession over with. So I'll start with a clip of a short film, a short clip of a film, just because it's fun. It's nothing to do with anything here, and then we'll go from there. When I was a little girl, I really wanted a typewriter and my father bought me one. So why would you want a typewriter at that age? Well I couldn't play the piano. I couldn't learn. I wouldn't be bothered to learn but I did want, I did, I did want to type and um, I just did. I wanted a typewriter. Now, I bet we all have piano typewriter kind of stories lurking in our childhood. And um, I'm going to tell you about mine and the journey that led to uh, Colin Basingstoke. Um, I grew up in pre-revolution Iran under the rule of the Shah and went to a school where most of my teachers were political activists and dissidents, uh, quite intellectual uh, bunch. And uh, for a bunch of kids, we were quite politically aware, quite savvy. And uh, books by, banned by the government will be smuggled into the, into the class and passed under desk. And you take them home, looking over your shoulder in case you're being followed. It was quite exciting life for a 12-year-old. Um, and we were actually political uh, dissidents in the making, destined for the revolution in 79. Um, but I was never part of the inner circle of the kids because I discovered television and cinema and sneaked up to the cinema in the afternoon saying I was going to the library. and Our school did, didn't even have a library. And, uh, and I was hooked on American imports uh, like Star Trek and Mission Impossible and High Chaparral and the Monkeys. All 
beautifully dubbed in Persian. Uh, the, uh, the Iranian dubbing artists are amazing, and, and, uh, and Captain Kirk and Spock, fluent in Persian. The Klingons, fluent in Persian. And Captain Kirk would deliver those end of episode homilies in words used by uh, Rumi and Omar Khayyam and Hafez. Um, so, uh, and I would sleep in the garden at night uh, in the summer with jasmine and cherry blossom and, st and gaze at the Milky Way. In those days in Tehran, uh, the pollution was non-existent. You could actually lie in the garden as you kind of fell asleep and see the entire Milky Way. And um, so all of this came to an end in uh, 1975. I was sent to school in England and, uh, and because English wasn't quite there yet, I didn't speak many words. You kind of gravitated towards science and physics and math because it's it's got its own beautiful language. And I ended up doing physics at Nottingham University, where in my final year, uh, instead of doing something in the lab for my graduation, I was a stubborn kid. Uh, I told my tutor I want to make a film instead of doing an experiment and writing it up and presenting it for my graduation. This battle went on because he said no. I took it to the head of the department. He said no. And this went on for a couple of weeks. They went to the faculty. And the faculty finally said that there's this kind of crazy, stubborn Iranian guy who doesn't want to do a physics experiment. He wants to make a film. Finally, they voted. And they said, OK, but it has to be about a film about physics. And I ran out of the place and said, absolutely, you've got it. So I made a film about black holes. And what you're about to see has only been seen in public once since 1984. Um, now, the, the clip you're about to see, uh, a couple of things to know about it. Uh, I am so, so serious in this film. I take myself very seriously. Uh, the other thing is, I press far too many buttons, way too many buttons, in the spaceship. And, uh, and I have hair. And the story is uh, the science and uh, physics of uh, black holes. I got together with a bunch of friends. They converted the attic in the student house into an interior of a spaceship. They built a model for me, which we suspended from the garage ceiling with fishing line. I didn't have George Lucas's budget. Uh, so I zoomed in and out of the spaceship suspended against black velvet to create the sensation of movement. And every word is stolen from Stephen Hawking or Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Far that's an air freshener. and more buttons to be. There are many strange and interesting ideas associated with black holes. For instance, black holes serving as time machines, carrying us to the remote past or the distant future. Or gravity tunnels, providing interstellar or intergalactic subways that would enable us to travel to inaccessible places much more rapidly than we could in the ordinary way. Or how about this? A black hole the size of the nucleus of an atom solving all our energy problems. Now, <laughs> thank you. This is, you're the second audience who's seen this, uh, because it's not something you want to bring out. None of that stuff, obviously, I predicted happened. And, uh, but obviously, the, the, the space suit of the future is a woolly tank top and a silk tie. Uh, that film got me a physics degree a really good physics degree, and a place at film school. But there was a moment I had doubts, because I actually, buoyed by, the, by, buoyed by this physics degree, I applied to do a master's leading to a PhD. And I was actually, I filled in the form. I was walking across the campus in July to hand it in and sign up to MSc and PhD. But I was realizing, as I was walking through the campus, that I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. I'm doing it completely for the wrong reasons. Uh, Iranian parents don't let you marry their daughters unless you're a doctor or a lawyer or have got a PhD. And I realized I wanted to do this because I wanted to be called Taghi Amirani PhD doctor. And so I turned around. That was the wrong reason. I turned around, went home, put the application in the drawer, and I applied to film school. 
I got to film school and learned a lot. But one of the things I learned about film school, or being at film school, is this. And so, having stolen from Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking and all these people for my first film, at film school, I stole from Woody Allen, uh, one of my heroes. Uh, I, I've watched every film inside out, backwards, you know, thousands of times. In fact, uh, Woody Allen's films, or my love life, is one long Woody Allen film without the laughs. And so, uh, having been at utterly blown away by Manhattan, I made a short black and white comedy at the end of my film school year. Uh, very, very, very cheap. It was uh, like made for like probably several hundred pounds. There was no sound because we couldn't afford sound, so it's a silent black and white romantic comedy. That's the Queensboro Bridge, the classic shot from the poster in Manhattan. That's mine. That's in Bristol. That's the Bristol Suspension Bridge, built by Brunel. And, uh, and so uh, that got me a job at, in television and finally led to making my first film, and, which is the one we were to see this evening. Oh, sorry. And I, just a quick reference, you have to see this film. If you've never seen this film, you are like so missing. Must see this film, it'll blow you away. Uh, this, Woody Allen, Carl Sagan, led to my first documentary, the one you're about to see tonight. This kicked off a career in television making films about eccentricities of the British. Uh, this film is about a car park attendant. I think you call them parking lot attendant. During the day, he's a park car park attendant. At night, he's an exorcist or a spirit medium. He exorcises ghosts. Uh, Britain's only African-American or black, uh, black ventriloquist. Uh, he has actually two dummies, but the other one didn't show up. He has the two dummies on stage, and they fight and kind of bounce off each other on the stage. And this one is about life uh, in inner city uh, community gardens, or we call them allotments. So there's this Iranian filmmaker sort of foraging in the back gardens of the, Ira the British psyche. I'm not quite sure looking for what. Uh, I'll just briefly say about a little few things about how I work, and then we, we go to the film. Um, when I start a film, I sort of don't have a plan. I deliberately don't over-research the film. I want the making of the film to be a journey. I want it to surprise me as much as it surprises the audience and the, the, the interviewees and the people in the film. Um, and I kind of don't also have an idea of the structure of the film, but at the beginning of every film, I know one thing for sure. I know how you're going to feel at the end of it, the emotional arc. So I'm driven by feelings. I'm, I'm driven, I, I kind of, uh, I'm a TED fellow, and TED is all about spreading ideas. <laughs> uh, like, I'm not an ideas man. Uh, I kind of uh, work my way through human stories and feelings to reach certain ideas. And so uh, this is what drives me. This is what kind of, uh, kind of sort of moves me forward. And so Earth Calling Basingstoke, you'll find out why it's called Basingstoke as you see it. This is my very first film. Uh, I got paid a lot of money for my first film, which made me a very cocky director so early in my career. Uh, and um, and it, although it's full of interesting people and astronomy and characters, I hadn't quite cracked weaving stories together. So what you're about to see is essentially a series of portraits. It's like character studies. Uh, and and there are some, we also deal with the planet Earth and environment before it was fashionable. This is 1989. So Earth calling Basingstoke. I uh, will get out of this. I will get out of that. Thank you. It was, it was all night long, it was, it was gradually building up into this fantastic, uh, like I've said before, cathedral of light all about you. There were reds, there were green. Uh, it was unbelievable. It was it, it really could. And, you know, it would be night, which would be very nice. Uh, the main structure was vertical streamers. Um, at the best, it was right the way around the entire horizon.
banging on the the earth, the end of the earth has arrived and went outside to be greeted by this awesome sight of 